Hello then everyone and welcome to this webinar. This is one of the many webinars we do around sort of big issues. And one big issue in the world today is inequality. So we're going to look at one specific area of inequality today, and that's health inequality. And we know that the COVID crisis has brought that into, into light more than normally it would, because we've seen the inequalities in health provision and delivery across the globe. And we've got with us Martin Drury today, who's from the Health Poverty Action Group. And he's going to tell us about health poverty and inequality. And he's going to tell us about the work of his group as well. So Martin, thank you for, you know, joining us today. And it's great to have you here. Can, can I ask you, first of all, if you tell us very briefly something about your background and what made you first interested in health um, poverty? Hi, Francis. Uh, it's nice of you to ask that. It, it's um, always good when we remember the people as well as the, the cause, I think. Um, and greetings, everyone. Thanks, uh, those watching and uh, later and those watching live. It's really uh, nice of you to join and great to be able to spend half an hour with you. Um, my background, a uh, uh, Yorkshireman, uh, started um, as a community development worker, um, worked in the voluntary sector uh, all my life. And um, uh, and and. I think if you often if you if you work on issues of injustice, you often want to focus on those where the the issues of the are are, are the biggest, you know, the greatest, where the uh, the, imp the human impact is the largest. So that that led me, not everyone, but it led me to uh, a focus on on global justice. Uh, a campaigner by background, I've uh, been involved in some of the, um, uh, uh, the 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 campaigns on on, on these issues, and uh, and and at the moment privileged to work for uh, the organisation Health Poverty Action, which, as you say, is uh, part of a global network. And and you're actually the chief executive of, uh, chief executive officer, aren't you, of Health Poverty Action? I mean, tell us what that is. Well, Health Poverty Action, it's um, an international NGO with a difference in that it's rooted in a, a global people's movement called the People's Health Movement, which I, I expect we'll talk a bit more about the values uh, and underpinning that. And uh, so we have about, um, uh, we're very locally led. So we have uh, a, a tiny, I don't, well, I haven't even got head office at all at the moment in London. Yes, we've abandoned the premises and we're all uh, working from uh, from home at the moment. But uh, we have a small um, uh, head office team, some of which in the UK, but a few are also around the world, uh, about 400 staff globally. And we work in um, uh, uh, 15 countries focusing on uh, health, justice and all the determinants of that. So when you talk about health poverty and indeed health justice, what do you actually mean by that? Yeah, well, health, health, health justice, I suppose, is the, uh, the positive way of framing uh, health poverty. We call ourselves health poverty action because we, uh, um, it, because in order to highlight the interconnectedness between the two. But um, uh, our, we believe that you can't tackle health without also tackling social justice and even more than that um, health isn't just the absence of disease it, it's about uh, whole uh, wholeness well-being which has to take into account our relationships with others our relationships with the planet also so we would say that um, uh, social justice global justice uh, climate justice uh, isn't just a determinant of health it's actually part of health so i mean when you do your work is your focus really across boundaries globally, or do you concentrate on individual countries and try to influence decision makers there? Well, we, we try to do both. So I, I, you know, it's, it's that old um, uh, phrase, uh, um, think, uh, lo um, uh, think global, act local. And um, most of the action is at local level, led by local people. You know, it's not health poverty action doing it. It's local people uh, uh, taking action to uh, determine their, uh, uh, to affect their determinants of health. That's what primary, the primary healthcare approach is all about. It's a movement. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're taking action in solidarity with that movement. Um, but because we also have uh, th this connect, you know, these connections around the world, 
that gives us a level of credibility. It gives us a political voice. And uh, we believe we've got um, a, a, a moral duty to use that. So, uh, yes, it's um, a very uh, movement based, advocacy led uh, uh, work at local level around the world, to a certain extent at country level um, and, and globally. You know, we try to uh, we address some of the global determinants of health through our own advocacy. Well, you say global, and you also say in, in, in some of your publicity that uh, health poverty is rooted in the global system. Mm -hmm. So what is it about the global system that you think impacts on poverty across the world? Where to start on, on, on that one? But I, I think I, I, some of the, some of, uh, a lot of the issues will be well known to I'm sure everyone that's uh, that's interested in what in watching this webinar. So the issues of, of, of tax justice that determine whether or not states are um, uh, strong enough and stable enough to be able to fund uh, and, and regulate health systems and the other uh, uh, essential uh, um, systems education that are, are necessary uh, in order to ensure health and well-being, um, climate justice trade justice all of those i think what what we try to do at health poverty action because we're the, our whole ethos and that of the people's health movement is rooted in in the concept of health for all inclusivity it, we the approach is very much a um, a social justice one and that means all should be included so what that me where that leads us is that um Typically, when people are allocating budgets to address determinants of health, the natural temptation is to allocate them in the areas where, you know, there appear to be the greatest numbers or for, a you know, per dollar, the greatest number of needs can be addressed. And the trouble with that is that it uh, leaves marginalised populations that might be politically marginalised, geographically marginalised with nothing at all. And, um, and I said, and you know, the approach would be, well, yeah, they'll come next, you know, and and, uh, and if that's the case, that term will never come. So our, our, uh, our principle is that the most marginalised put them first, address their priorities first. And that means that the populations, the people that we work with, the communities that we work with, are um, uh, very marginalised, uh, often ethnically, geographically, a lot of indigenous populations. And... Um, that uh, affects the nature of the approach globally. Just as we try to work with populations that uh, others uh, aren't working with, globally, we also try to address some of the political issues that the sector we feel is, is, is tending to neglect as well. So a, a couple of those that I'd, I'd highlight, uh, one is the war on drugs. The, that's a huge determinant. Um, you know, it's a, it's a US-led imperialism as a policy, and it's causing a huge poverty uh, uh, around the world. And by the sector, the, what we call the development sector, almost never mentions it in terms of advocacy. Uh, and it's right up there alongside debt, trade, uh, and, and tax justice, in our view, as a determinant of poverty. The other one is the whole narrative about what we're about as a sector which usually called either the development sector or even the aid sector. And both of those terms define our cause in a way that is totally both unethical and inaccurate. Uh, you know, the, um, so we do, we've tried to do a lot of work around reframing the narrative. So as, as you introduced at the start, a focus on tackling inequality um, and, uh, and, and trying to, talk about the global equity, you know, call ourselves a global equity sector, redefine it, never mention the A word, A-I-D, -A -A not even going to say the word. Yeah, yeah, I guess that, that's one of the, that fuels the rise of populism and it fuels a false narrative about the relationship of countries like the UK with the rest of the world. Tell me, you mentioned the war on drugs. Yeah. In what way does that increase inequality or health inequality? Thanks for asking. Yeah, well, uh, a, a lot of ways. So one of one of the um, uh, the, the big ones is that um, it the um, it, it it fuels the destabilization of states. 
So uh, uh, fragile states is one of the uh, things that can undermine uh, progression towards global equity more than anything else. And uh, uh, if you're, uh, for, for the poorest and most marginalized, they need many things, but two things that are absolutely essential to the realization of their rights is uh, a state that has the financial resources, the tax revenue to deliver the essential services and the state that's accountable. The war on drugs takes away both of those in many countries of the world. Um, secondly, it's a huge um, diversion of finance. The uh, this global spend on the war on drugs is about the same as a global AID budget. And, um, it, and that's just the initial spend. Once you start clearing up all the mess that the conflicts that it fuels causes, the spend is much greater. Um, and, um, and, and then it, you know, there's, there's the, uh, the, the climate damage that's caused by the uh, eradication, the racial justice issues uh, that are involved, uh, the, the incarceration of people of color. Um, there are so many social justice issues that are built into that. Uh, and it hurts health rather than protects health. So for all kinds of reasons, it's a major de determinant of global poverty. Okay, so you say you work with marginalised communities, ignored, commu ignored communities worldwide. Um, it seems to me you're doing two things. One is you're working with them so they can tell their stories, because that's fairly important that people do tell their stories, because it creates an emotive link. Mm -hmm. And you also try to take action to help. Am I right in summing up that those are the two main focuses of your work? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't use the word help so much as, as, as action in solidarity. Um, I, I think, uh, and, and we would never deliver, we don't deliver services ourselves. What we do is, 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 is act in solidarity to strengthen what's already there. So, uh, and, and that, that can be um, uh, the, the embryonic state systems, but it can also uh, be traditional systems and often bringing those together one of the things that I learned when I, I joined the organization, I never really realized, I hadn't really thought through, was um, the importance of healthcare being uh, culturally appropriate. Um, if I'm totally honest, I would always have believed in that, uh, you know, as an aging hippie, but it, it, it would have, uh, I would probably have felt, but if your life depends on whether or not you can access the healthcare, isn't it being culturally appropriate a bit of the icing on the cake? And and I and it's not you know it, I I, I realised the um, uh, when I one of the first visits I made to Latin America, where there in indigenous culture the um, uh, birth is, is given in a, a vertical position, a rope from the ceiling that the woman holds, um, a partner will support her physically from the rear, should give birth um, fully clothed as, as fully clothed as possible, um, the placenta has uh, spiritual significance. Um, the, uh, and it would, she'd be given that uh, afterwards. If she went to the state uh, health clinic, uh, first of all, her partner would be banished from the room. She'd be stripped naked, lying down on the, the trolley with the, uh, the, her legs in the stirrups, would, uh, wouldn't be allowed to have the placenta. Um, she would be a different ethnicity, probably, to the staff. And whether or not they were rude to her, she might perceive a, a level of prejudice. And they wouldn't speak her language. So she'd go through all that experience. You know, and, and once you've gone through that, you go back to the village and tell that story. No one else is going to go and give birth. So I, I learned very quickly that uh, healthcare that isn't culturally appropriate is the same as having no healthcare at all. And one of the things that we've been instrumental in, um, I think it's fair to say pioneering, not the only ones, but uh, with a few others, is, is bringing together the traditional and the state systems so that now in um, a, a good number of countries, it's legally required for, the, for these traditional facilities to be available in the, the state clinics. Okay, so, so you gave an example there of how you would tell a story that, that people might not have heard of in, in the yeah. way that they should. You also tell you, you also say that you strengthen what's already there and you bring together the traditional and the state systems. Can you give us one example of um, some of the communities you've worked with where you've done one of those things? Well, I think, yeah, so I, I, the, I'll tell you one uh, uh, particular story uh, in, in, in a second. And I think one of the, the, the key things that, um, that's um, 
integral to the approach to the people's health movement is all that integration and comprehensive nature of healthcare. And um, so one, one approach that we take is um, we call it supply side and demand side. So uh, what and addressing those together. So one thing is about strengthening the health systems so that they're in a, in a, they have the capacity to deliver. Another is about strengthening the community voice to hold that to account, to monitor it and hold it to account. And that's incredibly effective because the community experience success because they're demanding things that can be delivered. And secondly, the delivery is, uh, is held to account and, and monitorable. Now, one, one place where um, uh, uh, an experience that really stuck with me is in, in Somaliland. So that Somaliland's a good example of a pop large population that is largely neglected at an international level because it's not recognised by the uh, official uh, systems. And um, the uh, uh, I, I, I met a woman um, and her baby, uh, the baby had just given birth uh, by cesarean section in the hospital. Now, the... Um, she had been, she was uh, from a, a rural population and had been, uh, 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 was uh, being attended by the tr uh, traditional birth attendant. And um, the programme had uh, done training to link traditional birth attendants with the local state clinic. So, uh, and, and provided mobile phones with airtime and, 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 and a level of, uh, and a connectedness that they recognised. So the first thing, and, and also train, they were trained to recognise complications. So the complication was first of all recognised by a traditional birth attendant. She called the, the clinic who sent out um, uh, a, a, an ambulance that had, uh, was, uh, had also been provided by the programme. Also, the clinic wouldn't have been open because it only used to be open two hours a day, but that had been refurbished and equipped, so it was open 24 hours a day. Um, they recognised that they couldn't uh, deal with the problem, that it needed surgery. Uh, so they contacted the um, uh, maternity unit of the hospital, which again had been uh, had its capacity built uh, as part of the programme. And uh, they sent again also their ambulance, which had also been provided as, uh, uh, as part of the programme to pick her up. And then she gave birth uh, uh, safely in the hospital. The reason I say all of that is that had any single link in that chain not been there, if you didn't have that continuum of care, it wouldn't have worked. As a project to the donors, you would have been able to demonstrate impact. You know, we provide, we refurbish this clinic, train these mid, uh, traditional birth attendants, tick box, and it would have been done. But without the continuum of care, the holistic approach, it wouldn't have uh, ultimately... Does, does that mean that when you find an individual case like this, you can somehow get the system changed by showing those in authority the links that take place? Is that what you're trying to do? You take individual cases, try to change that, and then change the system? It, it's certainly something that's built on experience. So I, I, I think... Um, as I say, the, uh, the programmes aren't developed by people in London, they're developed by uh, local staff. And um, for a lot of, you know, for some of them, it's their life's work, you know, working in, in, in those areas. And most of our staff are from the communities that they, they work with. So there's a lot, a, a lot of accumulation of experiential learning and, 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 and knowledge. And um, uh, to the extent that they can benefit from our solidarity is that uh, and, uh, our of scale, you know, and, and, and uh, institutional nature enables us to access funds that uh, couldn't be accessed by them directly. And, um, uh, and we, we try, you know, one of the flaws is, is that funds are always so controlled by the donors, the donor priorities. So you never know what opportunities are going to arise. You don't know what's going to be funded next. You don't know if you'll win the bid or not. So what we have to do is to try and develop this, you know, uh, pool of understanding, and then um, when an opportunity arises, puts a, a bid together that will um, uh, strengthen what's already there, and that's where you have an opportunity to advocacy. So a, 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 something that we're out, we're so thrilled about. We've passionately wanted to work on mental health care for years and years and years. And uh, even now, everyone talks about mental health care being so important, but nobody funds it. But um, we had a, a, 
by DFID, a, a program, a, a, some funding to strengthen the health system, again, in Somalia on this one. And um, we negotiated and negotiated and negotiated to try and get, uh, include a mental health care component in that. And uh, a lot of resistance, but in the end, it was agreed. And that um, helped strengthen um, a, a mental health hospital in one of the cities. And I visited that hospital and it, it was, which is a real wake up call. It, it, was, um, it was actually a prison, uh, genuinely a prison building, a former prison building. So the patients were in cells uh, and in chains, and uh, many of them. And so, but it, it, it had a, 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 a very committed psychiatrist had been appointed who wanted to change it. And we were able to support that. And as part of that, so the advocacy component was part of all getting DFID to agree to fund some mental health care component. But secondly, alongside that, we were able to, uh, to advocate to the national government to agree to uh, put in place a no change policy. OK, um, so, so you talk about individual cases that you deal with, you talk about storytelling, you talk about trying to ch change governments, but you began by talking about the global problem yeah. and you can't address one country's yeah. um, solutions without looking at the total global problem, can you? Yeah. And you're involved in the people's health movement, aren't you? Is that a way of trying to create a global network to work together in a collaborative way to address health poverty? It hundred percent is yes, and and uh, and that again, you know, it's built at local local level. There are country circles. It's very decentralised, but it's also um, a, a global people's movement that has been world changing. It dates back to uh, um, uh, a conference, a UN conference in nineteen seventy eight at Al in Kazakhstan that um, uh, uh, pioneered what was called the primary healthcare approach which is a very politicized, let's, you know, let's use the word, health's a political issue. It was a very social justice orientated approach to primary, uh, to health, to primary health care. And um, the, uh, and that was associated with the UN target of achieving health for all by the year 2000. It talked about it, it creating a new international economic order. It talked about, um, uh, 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 disarmament and conversion of military expenditure to healthcare. Very radical statement. And um, for a few years, the construction of new primary healthcare systems, locally based, community led, accountable, uh, free, were um, uh, were starting to be set in place. Then in the 80s, along came the uh, rise of neoliberalism, Thatcher and Reagan. And what happened by the year 2000? You didn't have health for all, you had a global health crisis. And um, at that time, um, that movement, this is campaign for those at that Almorata declaration, called the People's Health Assembly, to which thousands came, many self-funded activists from some of the poorest parts of the world, and formally inaugurated um, uh, ourselves as the People's Health Movement. And Health Poverty Action was born around those, those early years after Almorata and has always had its roots in that movement. And that's what holds us to our values. You know, that's how, where we see our accountability as an INGO. Um, so it's, it's very important. And, and, and together, you know, absolutely, you know, at a global level, the, the causes, the drivers of health inequity can be changed. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the Omota principles, uh, which happened, as you said, in 1978. Um, but you responded to that. It, you know, it, it's a move away from a market-led approach to uh, a more collaborative approach. Yeah. And, and I suppose the whole uh, idea of justice is is really about doing that as well. I mean, we hear a lot about justice now, not just health justice, but as you said before, tax justice, climate justice, trade justice. What does this word? What does this word justice? have in common amongst all those different areas? Mm. I, I, th I think fundamentally what we need to, 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 to focus on is, is equity. I, I think one of the biggest problems that we have actually uh, in the world right now in, in terms of achieving change is, is this concept of charity and aid. I did use the word there, but then I'm using it in a negative way. Because what that does, it, it, it puts people on opposite sides to each other. You know, it tells people who are suffering, suffering again, uh, um, you know, with you know, hardship in the UK, that um, 
there are people elsewhere who are suffering more and it's it's their right it, you know it's your rights or theirs and and that's a false narrative you know the, if instead we talk about making the world a fairer place what the labor party needs to do uh, when it gets back into power is not reinstate diffid and reinstate aid it needs to fundamentally transform that and instead say that that 0.7 percent budget will be used to tackle inequality and hold the global elite to account that puts ordinary people across the world on the same side and it actually a lot of the activities are the same clamp down on tax dodging strengthen the uh, the, uh, the the chances and the you know the life chances of those who are the, you know suffer because of injustice but it's a far better framing yeah, I mean, that's interesting because aid often is used to further state goals rather than to provide aid. And, 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 and you know, focusing on inequality changes the whole ball game in that. Absolutely. Let me ask you something about climate justice, because, you know, many people will argue that the biggest problem we're going to face from now until the end of this century and beyond is climate change. And climate change is disproportionately affecting the disadvantaged people in the world. Do you do anything around the campaign for climate justice and, in it, and its impact that it will have on public health and other forms of health worldwide? We, we, we certainly do, yeah, and it's absolutely right that that is going to be one of the, what already is, uh, um, a, a, a driver. We, um, uh, we're always trying, I think one of the things that you need to do if you're an activist is look to where you can add, add the most value. So I, I, I think the, uh, at a global level, you know, the volume uh, for, um, uh, for climate justice is, um, uh, is strong. And I think, uh, you know, and we absolutely, you know, sign up to those and we support the, the, the statements and, and, and the solidarity initiatives. Um, I, I think um, our individual staff time in terms of advocacy, we've focused on areas that others aren't working on. You know, like the war on drugs uh, and, um, and and reframing the, the narrative in order to make it you know possible to uh, ch change the ball game of, the, of this political cause. Um, but where we have done a lot more on, on climate justice is at the local level, which is 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 is, is about disaster preparedness and about trying to address uh, the impacts of uh, climate change uh, in the uh, 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 communities where we uh, uh, we're in partnership. Okay, um, so you, in a way, I think probably um, develop the work you do from a bottom-up way, um, and you work with networks across the world. You're not trying to get people elected. You're not doing it from a top-down way. You're doing it within communities, working with them. Are you confident is that this bottom-up approach globally will be strong enough to be able to make a difference? I think you need both. I think you need both, and and uh, and we do try to be uh, active in both. So I, I think um, if we um, and 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 the um, issues aren't uh, articulated in the same way, of course, at community level and global level. So you know the advocacy priorities that I would identify about reframing the narrative of our, of our cause, changing the language, you know, to call ourselves a global equity sector, not the development sector, all of those things. You know, when I visit a, a rural community, you know, and discuss their issues, they don't tell me that what you need to do is to campaign to, you know, reframe the, the narrative and so forth. Um, I, I, so the, um, the, you know, the approaches are different, but totally connected. And, and, and I think the great danger is being, um, too distanced at, uh, in the advocacy that we do at global level and, and, um, and can sometimes make the wrong compromises if we're, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're making, you know, a, a, a about what's really important to those who are at the cutting edge of injustice globally. So I think the connectedness, the networks, uh, and ultimately the accountability, the, the, the accountability, which I think a, a, a movement like the people's movement can be a lot better at than more institutionalized uh, global, you know, UN bodies and, and other, even large INGOs, you know, other global institutions. Is that because, in a way, you're in the business of cultural change, changing attitudes, and not just structural change? Yes, structural change as well, 
but trying to engage people and to think differently. Yes, to use your word, change the narrative, but really to get people to understand in their own minds and in the way they feel that mm. this is a real problem that could have repercussions on world stability in the, in the future. Mm. I think I think one of the I, I think we need to talk a lot more about power dynamics and and and, and power analysis. So I, I the um, there's a, a debate at the moment about. Um, uh, decolonizing development, decolonizing aid. Again, I think as soon as you, simply those terms, you've lost <laughs> that debate by using, thinking about them in those ways before you start. But um, the, what, I think poverty in, in ultimately is, is less about lack of money and wealth, more about lack of power. You know, Gandhi didn't have much in the way of, uh, of money and wealth. But to describe him as a poor person isn't quite, you know, doesn't quite fit. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's 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 lack of power. So I I think in a movement, one of the you know the things we need to keep challenging ourselves on, in you know uh, when we're working political change, is where's the power emanating from? Where's the power operating? The, those who uh, are. At, the, at the, the sharpest cutting edge of injustice? Is it putting them in a stronger position? Is it making their voice stronger or weaker? Uh, and I, and I, I think, I hope, and I do believe that in the people's health movement, it, 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 you know, it, it, the, the, the power, nothing's perfect, but I think the power is much more rooted where it should be. Um, uh, you know, we're an NGO. You know, we're, we're a, I'm a white man living in the UK. Uh, I don't run it. I couldn't determine what a programme is going to be in Myanmar. But but it, it, it's nevertheless, you know, the, our head office is in the UK. I'm a white man. So we're an interface. You know, we're not perfect. But the movement can hold us to account and it can make us better. All right. Well, we've sort of come to the end of the 30 minutes now. So if anybody wanted to find out more about your organisation and what you do, how would they contact you? Where would they go? They can go to the website healthpovertyaction.org or they can uh, reach out on Twitter or uh, we're, we're, we're blessed with not having uh, too many followers to be able to respond. You reach out to us, we'll reply, we'll, we'll answer. You can, uh, follow me, I'll, I'll follow you back and you can message me on, on Twitter or, as I say, your emails on the website, reach out, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, thank you for doing that because that was really interesting and um, you know, people often think of poverty, but they don't think of health poverty. They think of inequalities, but they don't think of health inequalities. And they have, I think, recently began to do that because of COVID. And I think because of climate change, they will increasingly do that as well. So the work you're doing, I think, is really, really important, both to change attitudes, to change culture, to look at where power really is and to confront institutions as well, to bring them on side to your agenda. So thank you for doing it. I think it's been really interesting. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think you've told a, a really important story. So uh, we'll end this part of the interview now. <laughs>